to rest, rest in the Lord, um, that they would be able to grow in their relationship together, grow in their relationship with the Lord together uh, during this time, see some family and some friends. Um, also, I know with, uh, please keep pastor's um, mom in your prayers as well with all that she's going through in the family. There's a lot of things going on in their family, so we just really appreciate your prayers, all right, for them. And so we have all kinds of guests coming and, and, and sharing the word uh, with us for the next for the next month. All right, so what I want to give you a quick announcement. We, Shelton, did you share about the National Day of Prayer? You did, didn't you? Yes, National Day of Prayer. All right, so the other announcement that we have is on the youth group, all right? On our, on our youth group, we're going to Tennessee and June on a missions trip, June 19th. Um, 25 of us are going. And as you probably know, maybe not all of you are aware of what's going on. That's why I'm trying to... That's why I want to tell you about it. So we have a letter out in the foyer. If you're inter interested at all about getting, understanding more about what we're doing, why we're going, and, and the purpose that God has, that, we, that I believe is the leader that he has for it. So I don't want to make you get involved in any way. I don't want you to feel obligated in any way. There's a lot of you who have already been involved, but those that don't know anything about this, um, it's an opportunity as you are led by the Spirit to be able to get involved through prayer or through giving um, or through encouragement or whatever. Um, so what I will tell you right now, where's the, the update so far is that we, um, through, through um, support letters and through projects, we've done um, about five, six, five or six service projects up to this point, community projects. The youth have worked very hard. They come to meetings every two weeks. They learn Bible verses. Um, they're there every two weeks. They've been working hard on these projects. And the whole point uh, is that we could really grow together as a group and also grow in our relationship with the Lord and then also be able to serve the Lord um, with these um, um, low-income families in Tennessee that we're going to. Um, so what they've been able to accomplish so far with the letters and the support, we, they have been able to raise 95, around, I haven't got the latest, but $9,500. Isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. $9,500. So I'll tell you what's left. If you still want to be involved, there, there, are, there are six meals that we have to raise for each of us. Uh, six meals each. That's not per included in that 9500 that we Right, so you can give to that. We also have fuel, um, fuel needs to get there and back with that bus. We're taking the bus. All right, that's going to be an adventure. I am so excited. I'm so excited. It's probably going to be the highlight of our year. I'm pretty sure it's going to be mine uh, one way or another. It's going to be a highlight. I just know it. And uh, we also bought tires for the bus, so we'd like to pay for those. Those were like $2,500, but we needed new tires. And so the grand total that we still need is between five and 6,000. I don't know how much gas is going to be. I have no idea how much that bus gets. I, 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 probably under 10. And, uh, okay, so, but it's going to be fun. So if you want to be a part of it, equal part in what God is doing. Seriously, it's how the body works. Equal part, be able to see what God is doing in the youth and in what he's going to be doing in Tennessee. Feel free to pray. There's a place that has prayer requests on there, what you could be praying for, um, or, or giving, giving to the needs for the last ones. You can just, you know, cut off the bottom and throw it in the um, foyer. You can go online, go to Gateway Bible Online, just like you normally do when you're giving, and you can look at Copper Hill 2022, and it will go to the youth group, okay, if you want to give in that way. All right, so we're real excited about it. Um, I'm really, we're really excited, we're really excited. It's going to be it's going to be a blast. And so we're going to have a good time. All right. So kids, let's, pr let's pray. All right. Before we get started. Father, we just thank you so much for this time together. Um, thank you for your amazing love and your amazing grace in our lives. Lord, we do hold on to you. Lord, we just um, want to lift up Slade and Pastor and his wife and Kathleen um, during this month. We just trust that you would just hold them close to your, in your hands. And they'd be able to experience your grace in a new way and your love in a new way, the knowledge of you. It'd just be a sweet, just be a sweet time for them. Sweet time as they are able to go on a retreat and get a little bit of counseling and just a refreshing time. 
I just pray for that, uh, all that, that they would draw closer to you. I also just pray for the dear mom, uh, Martha. I just pray for this that situation too. And um, just guide and help the whole family during during that and just being sensitive to them, all the brothers and sisters and, and all the family members and, as they encourage and support her. Also, I just want to lift up those that um, I, I know Lindsay, um, one of her good friends just lost uh, a baby at 31 weeks and we just uh, pray for that situation. We just lift them up to you. You are the God of all comfort um, as the mom and dad are brand new believers and and uh, Lord, that they would be able to turn this all into praise uh, through this. Uh, Lord, I just pray from the music to the message, Lord, you would be glorified, you would be lifted up during this time. Help us to all learn from you, from your word. And uh, we just want to give you the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you know me, uh, I want to ask you a question. Always ask a question, just have to. My question for you today, it's a Whitman question, if there's any uh, Whitman questions. How do you smell? <laughs> How do you smell? What do you smell like? All right? And let me clarify just a little bit. Spiritually speaking, how do you smell to the world? How do you smell to the believers? How do you smell to the unbelievers, to the lost. Yeah? Do you manifest a sweet fragrance of Christ um, or a stinky Travis? Right? Do you, do you smell like Christ or do you smell like you just got done cleaning up goats after, you know, Tara's farm, you know, Tara and Chad's goats, you know? How do you smell to the world? You see, we have been given an incredible privilege by God as believers to live in a way that shows off the abundant grace that has been lavished on us. We get to show off our daddy to the whole world, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I, I want to confess I have a new favorite smell, and I want to give the credit to uh, Mark Ray. He's, uh, he, he graduated from DTS, and he's on staff at GSOT. And uh, he gave me this idea about rose, the rosemary plant. I have a new favorite smell. Does anyone have a rosemary plant at their house? Okay, you guys already know. It. I didn't know this. This is brand new for me, okay? And, um, I mean, I've used it on foods, but nothing. I've never seen it in the wild or anything like that. And uh, it is amazing. It is a great smell. They're big. You can give them, like, bushes or they're small. It's a little herb. I got one right here, okay? Just in case you haven't seen one, there's one right there. And... Um, and that you can use the oil. The oil just comes right off on your hands when you rub it, you know. And you can use it for soaps and perfumes. And you can use it medicinally for headaches and coughs. I was talking to Aaron this week. I was, I was getting excited about this plant. I had to mention it. He goes, yeah, yeah. I, Trav, I use it, I, I use it when, I, uh, when I get bit by ants. I get bit by ants and I just take some, break it off, and throw it on there, the oils, rub it on that. It's gone for the whole day. And that's cool, isn't it? Because I absolutely love Florida. Just side note here. My, I, I mean, I absolutely love. We are so privileged to live in this state, right? Um, but I do not like ants. They do not like me. They do not like me. I just swell up. I don't know what it is. Anyway, so that's a good remedy. Thanks. There's all kinds of things I'll let you go into um, that you can research it on your own. But even back in Roman time, in the Greek time, if you ever seen the, the Risen, have you seen the movie Risen? If you've seen that movie, Risen, but you'll see the Roman tribune, you know, after they were looking for Christ's body and he was around all this death. And after that, to mask the scent of all the death that was around him, he took a rosemary plant. You know, he rubbed it. I didn't realize that until just as I was studying it. That that's, that's, what he, that's what he did. So it's a really common thing. They would do it at night. They would burn rosemary and stuff, the Greeks and the Romans, to, during biblical times to, uh, to ward off bad spirits, of course. And... Uh, you know, it's not true. That's not going to do anything. But and to give them good dreams, you know, to give them sweet dreams and stuff. So you know what the best part of it, about it is? You guys can do this, okay? After the service, just come on up. Sit, you can eat it. You might not want to eat this one right here, but you can eat it. You rub this stuff. The oils come on. It is amazing. 
It is. And it's a sweet aroma. It really is. And it's, it, I think it's, now, the person, that, the things that I was reading, at, it says, it was, it is one of the uh, plants that God, it, one of the coolest things about rosemary is that it has the longest lasting fragrance of any plant that God has made. Seriously, after lunch, if I don't wash my hands, I'll be able to still smell it. I still smell it from the first service. It's good. It's amazing. It's got, so, do you smell like rosemary to other people? Do you smell sweet, you know? Or do you smell like stinky Travis? Okay, you don't want that. Okay? So, so how do you smell to those being saved? Or to the church? Or to even the lost? The those that have rejected Jesus? How do you smell to them? How do we smell? How do we smell to the rest of the world? Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 2. We're just going to go through three verses, 14, 15, and 16. And what I just want to give you just a little background because I love background information. So you know we're like 2,000 years removed from this book, right? We're 2,000 years removed from this book. And so the culture, historical background, all that stuff's very important. So when you're, when you're studying the Bible, when you're trying to interpret the Bible, it's called hermeneutics, right? You, you want to, one aspect to help you is to, Try to get a little bit of what their culture is doing, their historical background. So I just encourage you to stay. This is not inspired, but what I want you to know that the letters that we have in the Corinthians, you might not know this, okay? But this is, a, this is an agreement over most scholars. You might disagree, you might not, but this is what I believe fits best, okay, in, in our study, is this is how it went down. In Acts 18, okay, which... Uh, the youth should know, we just studied First and Second Thessalonians, but right after that, in Acts 18, when they were talking about Thessalonians, he, he, um, while he was there, he visited the Corinth. That was his first visit to the Corinthian church, okay? Or, you know, starting church. And then there's this letter. We don't have this letter. Letter one. See, so it's V-L-L-V-L-L-V. That's how you memorize it, okay? That's how I memorize it. So you have this first visit, and then you have this letter. This is a previous letter written to Corinth that was lost to us. You can look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to show that. Then, letter 2, all right, which is 1 Corinthians. That's our 1 Corinthians that we have today. It was written from Ephesus. Then, as you know, the Corinthian church, if you, if you do not know, the Corinthian church was a very, uh, it was a tough church for Paul. Okay, very tough church. And I think the, the world's influence was greater than the church's influence you know, on them. They're in a Roman city, right? All these things going on. So visit two, Paul went back to Corinth and he had a very painful visit to them, all right? And I'm gonna go into details of all that happened there, but there was a painful visit because the church failed to put into place all the stuff that happened in 1 Corinthians that he was encouraged them to do because there's all these divisions and all the stuff that was happening in church. So he paid them a visit and it was a very sorrowful visit, all right? And then we have a letter three. He wrote a sorrowful letter to them Okay, which we do not have. I don't believe we have that letter. All right, he wrote a sorrowful letter to them, which is also lost. And then the letter four, which is 2 Corinthians. Okay, 2 Corinthians, Paul was glad. The church did respond to them, and you'll be able to see all that. I, I can't go into all the details to that. And then we have visit three. So we have letters two and four, all right, of the whole thing. That's what I believe, all right, has happened to give you that. But the thing is, Paul, there's no other epistle no other epistle that Paul wrote, of all 13 epistles that he wrote, there's nothing more intimate than 2 Corinthians, where he just bears his soul. He bears his heart. I want to encourage you to read it, right? He's going through some really hard times because why it's the most impersonal is because he, he bears his soul because he, he professes his, amaz his abiding love, the love of Christ to these Corinthians but they do not love him back, despite there's many that don't love them back. And, he is, and it's breaking his heart, all right? These false teachers are coming in, and they're saying they are, um, they're saying they're apostles, and they're getting into the church, all right? And they're just wreaking havoc with the Corinthian church, all right? And it was such a heartache, such a heartache for Paul. And so he wrote this book to defend, to defend his apostleship. To show that, he, no, he, I am an apostle, and these guys aren't, all right? 
but they came in. And so that, that and right here in verse 14, right here to the, what we're going to study, all right? He breaks off from the narrative. He was writing the narrative to the Corinthians, and you'll see it from chapter 1 all the way to 2, 14, and then he breaks off right there at verse 14. And he doesn't conclude it. He doesn't start back or pick it back up until, not until first, 2 Corinthians 7, 5. So this is whole transition here. And it starts right here in verse 14. It goes on. And I think what's happening, okay, I, I'm, just for my study, I'm thinking what's happening is that Paul... He's just experiencing this heartache. He's feeling defeated from how they're, tr- they're treating him, all right? He's going through a really hard time with this Corinthian church. He loves them with all of his heart. He's poured his life out to them. He hasn't taken any money from them, right? And right here at this point in verse 14, he kind of goes, he, he kind of um, takes his eyes off of his circumstances, and he just points, and he just gets the perspective of the Lord. And he says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And he takes his mind off of what's going on, even all the heartbreak, and he's just saying, I've got the victory in Christ. I can have joy in that. And that's where it is. And it's just these three or four verses. It's not a tough hermeneutic. It's not really tough translating this. You'll be able to just get it right away. I'm just going to bring out a few points, Okay. From it. All right. So, without further ado, um, let's start there, verses uh, 12. Let's just start 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, and we'll just read to verse 17. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Okay, real quick, right here, he was going. To Troas, right? He, he sent Paul ahead to Troas, right? And he was going to meet him there, and he was waiting for Titus. When he got there, he was going to get the letter from Titus, receiving a letter from the Corinthians, like, hey, how are you guys doing? How'd you receive it? But as you can see, apparently, Paul sent him there, and he was missing when Paul arrived. When Paul arrived to Troas, he wasn't there. So he had no peace of mind, even though uh, the, the door was open to him right there. He had no peace of mind, because Titus, Titus hadn't yet arrived, his dear brother. And so he said goodbye to those there in Troas, and he went on to Macedonia. All right, he said goodbye, and then that's where he writes 2 Corinthians in Macedonia. And that's where we're going to pick it up here. Let's just keep going. 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many. And here's where he's talking about the, we're not going to talk about this verse, but um, peddling. These are the false prophets that are coming in, peddling the word of God, but it's from sincerity, but it's from God. We speak in Christ in the sight of God. So back to 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. So you see like three persons involved in that in verse 14, right? You see God the Father, you see Jesus, and you see us in those verses. So God has a rule, right? He leads us always in triumph. That word triumph, all right? Do you know that Greek word? I like the Greek word. I'm just going to say it. I usually don't say it because I don't want, I don't want you to think I'm intelligent or anything about this. But the word is three and buo. Three and buo. Is that not the coolest word ever? Three and buo. Anyway, that word is only used one time in the whole New Testament. It's right here. One time. All right? So when he shared that word, the Corinthian church knew exactly what's going on there. All right? But, and in the Old Testament, it's like six times. But in the New Testament, one time. It's this word triumph. What it means, I'm just going to tell it to you. So you, I'm just going to spoon feed you here. What it means determination, resulting in joy through difficult circumstances, all right? So this idea of triumph, it's, it's really, this word comes in the midst of difficult suffering, all right? He's going through trials, and there is joy. Does that mean that things change? Does that mean it always goes well for you? For Paul, it does not go well for Paul. You, if you look at his life, it was terrible what that man suffered through, right? But that you can still be triumphant in Christ, right? It says, and it says always 
God always leads us in triumph. Now, I want to tell you, for the last month, I have not been living triumphantly. This, this message is for me, by the way. I just want you all to know. If you can get out of it, that's great, but it's really for me. I've had a rough month, all right? Not triumphal run, month, but in Christ, I can. That's the whole point of this passage, right? That's why I wanted to study it. Definition. Just like Paul, we can triumph when we put our faith in here. In him, not on those circumstances. Paul, instead of looking at those circumstances, he looked at the triumphal Christ, right? So the focus is in the degrees of dif difficulty. I wanted to just say this. De degrees of difficulty are unavoidable, but they pale in comparison to the eternal nature of who we are and what we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Yep. Focus is on the grace, not on the circumstances. So we look at Christ, which is the second person, right? But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. You know, those two words, in Christ, my two favorite words in the whole world, right? In Christ. Because that, as believers, that's where we live, right? That's where grace is. That's, that's where power is. That's where God's provision is. That's where everything is, is in those two words, in Christ, right? And in Christ, we have that victory because Christ cannot fail, Right? He always gets the victory, always. And we are in Christ. There's no reason for me to feel defeated for the whole month because I have Christ, right? Because I can trust him in the midst and still have joy, determination resulting in joy during difficult circumstances, right? And the only way that we can always be triumphant is because Jesus is always victorious, right? And so we get down to the third person, which is us, read it again, but thanks be to God who always leads us, you and me, in triumph, he's talking Paul, right? <clears throat> leads us in triumph in Christ and manifest, King James will say, diffuses, I like that word, diffuses too, through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. When we live triumphantly, Right? When we're trusting Christ in a very terrible situation, or with everything, but especially in difficult situations, what happens? What, is, what does it say in the verse? He manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him, the sweet aroma of Christ in every place. So when we are pressed in and we trust the Lord through a difficult situation, this aroma, it goes to the whole world. It goes to everyone that's around you. Is that not amazing? That's cool to me, that God allows us to be a part of that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I just think it's great. We have purpose, right? We have a role to play, right? The Lord allows us to, totally by his grace, nothing that I've earned, all that he's done uh, for me. And so the knowledge of God becomes apparent to everyone, right? When we live triumphantly when we trust in his his provision his victory so I, I gotta just tell you a little about this this triumphal procession okay so scholars all the stuff that i've studied they would all agree on this all right when when there was this word was like this area of a triumph a triumph or a triumphal procession some some translations will actually say triumphal procession and that word the Corinthian church, as soon as they heard that, that word, when they saw that, when they heard that word, they would think of the Roman procession, all right? And this Roman procession that would come in after the general gets back from his victory, right? From conquering a country or conquering a certain group of people, he would come back into Corinth. Corinth was a, a Roman city, right? And he would have a parade, right? You have this parade. And even though it might be foreign to us, since we're 2,000 years, it wasn't foreign to them. They knew exactly what he was talking about. And I hate giving an illustration inside of an illustration. That's not good, but I'm going to give you one. Because when I studied this out, I was just thinking. When I, guys, in my high school years, I was part of this marching band. We went to this very small, so just give me a little second here. I went to this small school, right? A K through 12 school, 50 people in our, our, our school, 1,000 people in our town. My wife and I both grew up in the same exact town. One traffic light, very small town in Ohio, okay? And we had this amazing band, a marching band. And it wasn't because of me. I was just a trumpet player, just one of 
87. We had 87. I remember 87. I think that was counting the flag core too. All right. 87 member band. All right. And we would do these marching band competitions. And I'm telling you, it prepared me for the Air Force. I've got blood. I've got broken blood vessels on my legs from when I marched in high school. It was that hard. Our, our director was incredible. He really was. Why did I say that? I get broken blood vessels from my, from my <laughs> teeth. But it's good. But we would go to these competitions, and I'll never forget this one we went to. I, I'm getting to the point, okay? Just a second. Um, we went to the horseshoe. Okay, high state. Where high, I'm not a Buckeyes fan, but when we went to the horseshoe, okay, for this competition. We're a little 87-member band, Class C, and guess what? And we would win just about everything we did. We won. We got grand champion, beat double A class, 300-member bands. And guess what? When we came back, we got home like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, right? Which we usually do in the middle of the night. Renee knows all about this. And we would come, we would come back, and what would we do to that little? We would light that town up <laughs> at 1 o'clock in the morning. And we would march through that town. I don't care. We would blast as loud as I could. We would have our trophies in the front. I mean, these big trophies that we would have. And we just lit it. We just lit it. it was awesome. It was a neat experience for us. It's, I mean, you're just so proud to be a part of something so amazing. You know, this little, everyone's like, this little band, what are you going to do? And we just blast them. It was, it was a blast. And our, and our band director was a Christian too. He picked the best music. He picked the absolute best music. It was awesome. Anyway, so just in my mind, that's what came to me when I was thinking of this triumphal procession. But during this procession, all right, this is pretty much what I've studied. It looks pretty much, it's, they're pretty much agreeing with all this. Um, so at the very beginning, you, of course, the general was, was coming, not the very beginning, the very front would be the magistrates. These are very important people, you know, they'd be on the parade. All right, the second would be the senators, all those politicians, you know. Um, and then the third would be the musicians, you know, playing the trumpets, blaring it, you know, the sound of victory, right? And after that would be the spoils. The fourth thing would be the spoils, all the treasures, how they increase the value of Rome. So you can imagine just being on the sidelines and just watching all this stuff, right? All the treasures, even the models, like when they took ships and all that kind of stuff in the Roman, man, they would make little models of ships, and what they would take, and then they would take that in the parade. Isn't that cool? The gold, all that, all the spoils, everything is captured. Then the ox, the, the gilded ox, you know, oxen that they would be, they would sacrifice those unto their gods, right, to thank them for, you know, what, you know, to thank them for the victory. And then after that, all the prisoners of war, all the big shots, right? The, the kings are the ones that they conquered, the, one, the, the generals and the commanders of their armies. They would be in there, um, of course, they would be put to death at the end of that day, right? Um, that was the prisoners. And then behind them, and behind them was the lictors. You heard of the lictors. And the lictors were the ones um, that spread flowers down, and they would, they would uh, burn incense and this perfume, and this perfume of victory. And then when people would crush the flowers, they would, they would give off an aroma, right? An aroma of victory. It was a very distinct smell. With the, with the flower petals and, and the incense. And then behind the lictors, guess who would be in there? The big, bad general, right? The general, right? He would be, have a robe, purple robe on and a wreath, and he would be in a chariot, a big old chariot with a four horses, four white horse chariot. He would be in, and then riding with the general, guess who would be with the general? His family. His family would ride, and they were all clothed in white. And that's how, how it was. And that was this procession that you saw. That, that the picture that these Corinthians are seeing. And the scholars, this is where I disagree with some of the scholars. Okay, so you can, you can study it for yourself. But some of the scholars think that we are compared to as the lictors. The ones that are, are you know, crushing the flowers and doing the aroma and stuff like that. And bringing in the scents of, of the general. Or of, of Rome, you know. But... I feel, I agree with Mark, I think we're riding in the chariot with the general. We're riding with the general. Why? We're his family. We're clothed in white. He wants to show us off to the world, right? Not because of anything I've done. That's just who he is. That's what I see in scripture. What he has done with mankind in Christ is unbelievable. 
right? It's nothing we deserve. He doesn't pay attention to the worthiness of the gift. It's just who he is. It's who he is. And he gets the glory, not us, because he knows what we're made of, right? He knows what each and every one of us is made of and the stinky mess that I am without Christ, right? We ride with the general. We ride with Christ. Christ is the general that's victorious over this. And I feel like that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. It's an incredible picture. So go on to verse 15. You go to verse 15. Oh, yeah, so did I, I explain that? And manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. So as we, I just want to make sure you guys get this, because it's just, it's just real simple. As we trust Christ in, in difficult circumstances, we spread the aroma of Christ to everyone. That's incredible. So down, and then back to verse 15. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So as believers, in verse 15, we are the fragrance of Christ, right? He uses you and me to make known the fragrance of the knowledge of him. My life can be responsible for others' lives. Can they not be? And maybe even responsible for others' deaths. Right? We are the sweet fragrance. We have a role to play. God is using us to be, to be the fragrance of those being saved and those being sanctified by our actions, what we do, and what we say. So for a believer, can your actions help them? As a believer, if I'm with another believer, can they help them come closer to the Lord? Can they help them deepen their relationship with the Lord? Can your actions during, in the midst of a trial help someone else? Yeah, totally. Totally help. Can it help someone come to Christ? Totally. Can it help? What can it do for those that are lost? I'll get to that. Help them go deep. This can be a wonderful smell, just like rosemary. It can be a wonderful smell for you, for those that are in Christ, and they see how you respond to a trial or, or something. And it, it happens to me every day with you all. How you respond, it, it helps me in my relationship with all. It's a, it's a favorite smell for me. And I just want to just step back for just a little bit. I'm not going to be able to mention you all, but I know a man here. He's 80 years old. And he paints a lot of the stuff in this church. And the other day I was, I cleaned off the, I told him I had to clean the, the volleyball courts, the, the whatever it is that holds up the poles for the volleyball court. And uh, I just said, hey, what color do you think you want to paint this thing? I was asking him, and he said, well, this is what we have left. I said, oh, okay, that's awesome. I'll get on that. Well, last week, or I think it was last week, I get there. It's already painted. He's an 80-year-old man. He paints everything. And he don't just paint, like, the stuff you see. He paints the things you don't see. All right? Is that a sweet aroma? That is a sweet aroma. That is an example. What about this other family that actually, sorry, it's hard for me, went through a loss of their kid, lost three, actually. Well, what did they do? Sacrifice, they built two picnic tables for us, spent all that time doing that. Donated another playground to us. Been a blessing. In, in the midst of their mourning, they were able to build something. That is a sweet aroma. What about the one decorating this whole church? Uh, you guys haven't seen it since Christmas, right? It's just incredible. The, the sacrifice, uh, the hours that this person has put in to, to clean up this church. Right? That's just the physical. I can't tell you about all the prayers that's gone up, right? The prayers, all the spiritual things, the financial giving of this church. I should not be a full-time pastor with the size of the church. It's incredible the amount of giving this church gives. And, and the prayers, these ladies, and then that pray for all of us. We have an amazing body here. It's, it's incredible. It really is to be a part of such an amazing body. What about those who are perishing? What about, what is that smell? Just like those ones, the prisoners of war on that parade, when they smell that, what was that smell to them, you think? It wasn't one of victory. 
It was one of death. They knew that they, what they were going to. And so when you, when you come across a, a someone, and I know you all have, people that totally have rejected Christ. They want nothing to do with him. And so when, when they smell you, what do they smell? When they smell this body, what happens? Most of the time it's death. And it just makes them, it drives them even farther. Right? It can. It can drive me even farther. That's what John chapter 3 says. John chapter 3 says, what happens when you expose someone's darkness? Just by your presence. They, want, they like the darkness. They want to stay in the dark. And when you expose the darkness, right, it's hard for them. Right? They, they want to condemn it. They want to... My prayer is not that. My prayer is that when they see us, when they see you, they see that, they smell that sweet fragrance that they'll believe. They'll see the goodness of Jesus and they'll believe, right? So how? How do we make? I can't tell you this. It's, I can't tell you this without. You know, how do we manifest Christ? How do we manifest? How do we diffuse this amazing aroma, the rosemary of all rosemaries, to them, to the outside world? How do we do it? Just like Paul did. Well, I'm just going to give you one thing, one practical thing. It's. It's really simple. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Just keep your eyes on Jesus, right? I, I know it's, it, it's going to be very difficult for the last month. It has been very difficult for me. This has been a great reminder. But just like Paul did, he looks at all of his circumstances. He's feeling defeated, and he turns to Jesus, right, which can never fail. We can do the same, right, through our focus. We can regain that eternal heavenly perspective just like colossians 3 says set your mind on things above where christ is see at the right hand of god right set your mind on things that last right uh, i want to show you just three verses in second corinthians you can write them down three five nine eight and twelve nine that's three five nine eight and twelve nine i'm gonna read them you don't have to turn there three five we have to have our sufficiency everything is got to be in christ and not in ourselves practically right three five nine eight twelve nine three five says not that we are adequate in the same letter not that we are adequate in ourselves and consider to consider anything as coming from ourselves but our adequacy is from christ god right chapter nine verse eight and and god is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed and then 12 9 and he has said to and he has said to me my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness most gladly therefore i will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of christ may dwell in me so our, our, our focus has to be in the sufficiency of Christ, not in yourself. Every time you look towards yourself, you're going to be disappointed. But when you look to the Lord, He, and you get your mind, just get that picture, you get that heavenly perspective, it changes things, right? And you're able to think of Peter. What happened with Peter? Just a real quick illustration with Peter, right? He's, he walked on water, right? He was able to walk on water. Watching the Lord, keeping his eyes on Christ, he's able to walk on, on water. And then what, what happened when he got his eyes off water, or off of Peter, or off of Jesus? When he got off of, when his focus was off Jesus, what happened? He started to sink. He looked at his circumstances. He looked at probably himself. I would have been. I, I wouldn't have been any better, you know, any different. But when you are in Christ, Christ is the one that gave him the strength. He's the one that provided the power, right? He's the one that gave him the victory, the triumphal victory, right? And so, um, when we focus on grace, when we focus on Christ, we can live triumphantly, right? I was thinking about a, of another person um, in this congregation. I won't give any names. Um, but he was telling me recently, and it's probably been a couple weeks, I don't know, three weeks, something like that. And um, he, uh, he was saying, Trav, I need to buy a car. I just need to buy a car. My car I'm having is having problems. I really need to get a car. And so I kind of pointed him in a direction. Probably shouldn't have. Anyway, pointed him in this direction. He bought this car from a dealer. And this dealer, he, it, it was a big ripoff. I'm just going to tell you. It just, 
It, it's a lemon of a car. It doesn't work. It's useless, basically. All right? And it's really sad. And, you know, John, I'm just thinking, or, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what is he going to do? You know, he's going to go down there. I, he tried to call him. I tried to call the place. They won't answer their phones, you know. It, and he bought insurance. Supposedly, he bought insurance for the car in case it breaks, you know. He'll be able to just, you know, it's got a warranty with it. You know, three-month warranties you buy. Well, it w- didn't have one, per se. So he tried to call. I tried to call. No one said, like, what is he going to do? Well, we can go down there. I'm just thinking, I'm going to go down there with, I'm going to go out there with picket signs. Don't go here. You're going to get ripped off. You know how people do that. You know, I'm just so mad for him. And so I'm asking, I'm like, dude, what are you, you going to do? And it floored me. He doesn't know it. He says, well, me and my family are praying for him, praying for the company. Yeah, we can, he's at, around the table, we can, around our meal, we can pray for him. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> Everything in my flesh would say, no, man. I'm out that much money. I'm getting my money back or something. That is a sweet aroma. Is that not a sweet aroma? Unto the Lord. Not only to the Lord, but to them. They're praying. I'm thinking this week they're probably going to bring pizza to him for lunch or something like that. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, with his family. And uh, anyway, it was just, it was just a sweet aroma. It helped me understand just how precious that we can have the victory in Christ, you know, through all this. Anyway, so when we focus on Christ, we are transformed into the same image as the character of Christ, one character trait at a time. That's the next chapter over. We don't have time to go through there. But Second Corinthians 3 is talking about, you know, how we see dimly in the mirror, you know, but that's, that's what it's like. As we look at Christ, we are changed from glory to glory, just one day at a time, more and more into the image of Christ from the inside out. It's a grace work that God does through us and we become a sweet aroma. If we focus on the general, and if you continue to focus on the general, if you continue to focus on Christ, guess what's going to happen? You're going to smell like him. You're going to smell like Christ. And it's going to be a sweet aroma. It's going to be the rosemaries of rosemaries. It's to everyone. So I don't want you to leave discouraged. God always, always leads us in triumph. We ride with the general. Right? In Christ, we have it. We have a role or purpose to play in manifesting or diffusing the sweet aroma of Christ to the world. And what does the world smell when they smell you? When they smell us as a body? Is it a beautiful smell? Is it a favorite smell? Is it like rosemary? Does it smell like barbecue? I like barbecue. That smells good too. I'll take that too. Right? To those that are being saved, it's a beautiful smell. To those that are already saved, they can go deeper with him, right? It helps you get deeper with them, right? To see how someone responds in a, in a midst of a trial. What about a team? How a team responds? What if someone gets upset and then they, even if you mess up, let's say you just blow it, all right? You lose your cool, whatever. Can you not go back to that person? Can you not go back to the family, everyone involved, and apologize and and show them the sweet aroma of Christ still in the midst of disasters? You can. Yeah, you can. You can do it with your parents, with your kids. You can do it with your grandparents, your parents, with your brothers and sisters, whatever. You're able to. There's, it's never without hope. I hope that the world s- smells, the, the believers and unbelievers alike will smell something so sweet from you. Let's just say, maybe you're here. I'm just closing this. Say you're here and you have rejected Christ. You are not a believer. You're right here because you had a bad odor. You had a bad, someone left a really bad odor in you. Maybe it was a parent Maybe it was someone you went to church with. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. I don't know. Maybe it was a boss, and they claim to be Christians, and, they, and say they are Christians, but they messed up big time, and they just left a huge odor, and you don't want nothing to do with Christ. And it's like, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want nothing to do with it. And, and you've experienced that. I get it. I understand. 
But we give it a second chance with this body. This body right here. And will you just allow them to just love on you? And my prayer is that you will be able to see the goodness and the sweetness of Christ through this body, all right, that you will turn and believe. You will believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, right? And he, and he was buried and he was raised from the dead. And he lives from and you have new life. By believing in what Christ did for you on your behalf. He paid the price so that you can have eternal life. It's a free gift that he offers to everyone for those who believe. And that's my prayer that those who have rejected, it wouldn't be a smell of death. That Christians, that this body right here, as they smell you, that man, they just want everything that you have. Just sign me up. Believe in that. I know a lot of you have come to Christ because of others' sweet aroma, the sweet aroma of Christ in your own life. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this time together. Lord, you are an amazing God. I'm thankful that we are in Christ. Lord, your grace is just unbelievable. It's something that I don't deserve. I thank you for it. We want to be a sweet aroma to the world. Lord, just help us to understand how we can more and more grow in our relationship with you so that we can be. And we want to give you all glory, not, not for us, not so they look at Travis, but so they would look at you because that's, who they, that's truly what they're going to look at when they see the aroma of Christ. I pray for those that, do not, that are in this congregation that have never placed their trust in you. I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them, that they would trust, they would believe that you died on the cross for their sins. And by believing that, they would have eternal life and live for you forever. And they're part of an amazing family, this family right here, and the family of God. And I just pray for that. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.